So, welcome everyone to Thinking Outside the Box, Emotional Freedom Techniques or Psychological Acupuncture uh, for Adult Obesity. I'm Glenn McIntosh, I'm the Queensland representative of uh, the Psychology of Eating, Weight and Body Image Interest Group uh, and I would very like to, to warmly welcome Dr. Peter Stapleton. Uh, Dr. Stapleton is a clinical and health psychologist and has also been recently promoted to Associate Professor at Bond University uh, where she is also the uh, Program Director of the Masters of Clinical Psychology. Uh, in 2014, uh, Peter was awarded the American Harvey Baker Research uh, Institute Award for meticulous research into uh, energy psychology, which is her, her area of specialty. Um, in 2015, Peter also received the Global Weight Management Congress Industry Professional of the Year for her research and practice into emotional freedom techniques for weight management. Um, we're going to be talking all about EFT or psychological acupuncture, which I will leave to Peter. Uh, and the presentation will go for about 40 minutes with about 20 minutes of question time. But Peter has said she's quite open to, to, um, to receiving questions throughout, which you can just uh, type into the, the chat box. And if we get to them at the right time, then we'll certainly answer them. So welcome, Peter. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you for the lovely welcome and uh, invitation to present today. So yes, very happy. Um, and I do believe the slides may have been sent out to uh, anyone that's joined us. And if you miss those, we'll certainly make them available afterwards. So we'll get right into it. Basically, let me see if these will actually turn over. There we go. What I'm going to cover in the next 40 minutes is what is this topic of EFT or psychological acupuncture, we often call it. I and mean, it's also known as tapping because that describes the technique itself. What is it? How can it assist with weight loss, food cravings, emotional eating? How can it be used in group settings? And what's the research, I guess, um, which has been my passion for the last eight to nine years? So EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques. Now, the, the term itself and the technique has been around for about 35 years, so it's certainly not something we came up with. It has been around for a long time now. We often call it tapping because that's the technique itself. Um, when I talk to the media, I often talk about psychological acupuncture without needles um, because most of the community out there understand what acupuncture is. It's just we tap instead of putting a needle into a pressure point. So we've covered that little bit without the needles. But really what it is, is this unique exercise to calm you down so that you can actually think more clearly about your problem and maybe do something different. And we'll talk a little bit about what part of the brain it comes down in a moment. So we, it's brief um, and sometimes that's a little bit different to our traditional therapies out there. Um, it combines exposure therapy, which we use in a lot of other traditional therapies, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, that kind of thing, anxiety disorders. But it also has a cognitive therapy element. What makes tapping or EFT different is this somatic stimulation. So we actually use a two finger tapping process with our cognitive statement. And it appears through all the research that it is this somatic stimulation or the tapping technique that has most of the effect here. So we've researched now EFT in more than 10 countries. There's more than 60 of us out there who are doing this. Um, we've now got over 100 publications, 20 odd different peer reviewed journals, um, and that keeps growing. So the strength of the research behind EFT just keeps increasing. Where we started here in Australia, and I'm currently the only academic in Australia who's researching EFT like this, is because my clinical area is eating disorders, um, we just decided that's where we would apply it and see what's the evidence. So we looked at uh, adults who were overweight or obese and food cravings um, because that's fairly easy to measure. So we've published all those types of trials. We've looked at smoking. Um, Efficacy has also been established in the US and the UK into phobias, PTSD, anxiety, depression and pain. And we've done some of those studies as well. And what we do is we always do a 12 month follow up. So we find out does, does this technique last? What happens after 12 months? And like it says there in red, it's extremely successful and it lasts over time. 
So just to sort of let you know where is it at with the evidence-based um, kind of status. It is under review at the moment with this NREP organisation in America and they're a body who do give uh, the tick of approval if you like. They've just given it um, a couple of months ago to something called Thought Field Therapy, TFT there, um, for a range of different things. And Thought Field Therapy was a precursor to EFT. It's how EFT uh, was developed. So the fact that Thought Field Therapy has already achieved that evidence-based and EFT is currently under review and we have about eight studies of ours included in that. We are actually just waiting to hear that that's been accepted because we have more studies included in the EFT review than Thought Field Therapy did. So it's just a matter of time. So EFT has elements from conditioning, counter conditioning, so we're actually setting up an opposite response. We're setting up a calming response which is having a different effect obviously on things like the amygdala in the brain to the current state someone might be in which could be anxiety, could be pain, could be PTSD. We have the cognitive element that I'll um, outline in a moment so we actually do state what the problem is. The exposure therapy coming up there obviously fairly client-centered um, thought field therapy was where it originated from and just this whole idea from Einstein that we are all interacting with each other and certainly we know with tapping that if someone watches you tap mirror neurons fire in the brain um, and their brain, a client's brain will also um, have the change and mindfulness um, obviously being in the present moment when we do all of our tapping. So I guess I like this slide because um, it really sums it up. I guess the genius of EFT is you can actually pull up what bothers you like on purpose but also do something about it. So you can actually do that at any given time and, and it is a self-administered technique so it can be done outside the therapy room as well. So we do that with focus, so that is our mindfulness element and we do the tapping technique. And I guess it's no secret that, you know, touching and tapping um, is comforting, you know, people might massage their temples when they have a headache, that kind of thing. So here's the technique itself before we get into a bit about how do we use it for weight. So like we said, brief exposure therapy, cognitive and a somatic element. So what happens is the participant, the client, states what appears to be a negative cognition. What it actually is though is the truth about what is happening for them in that moment. So they are actually being present and they're acknowledging what their problem is. What they do though is they have on the end of that statement a self-acceptance end point. So it could be that, and that's just an example, even though I'm scared of heights, I accept this about myself anyway. If it was a food related one, it might be, even though I want to devour this chocolate bar and eat the whole packet, I accept that this is just where I'm at at the moment. So the acceptance part of the statement allows, I guess, that part of the brain to respond. Clients themselves rate their discomfort. That might be a distress rating, it might be a craving rating, a pain rating, a naught to 10. So naught is nothing, no distress, and 10 would be the most that a client would feel. After we've done that, we do the tapping part of the technique. I'll show you that in a moment. And we keep saying out loud a shortened version of that sentence there in red. So it could be that as we tap on the eight points on the face and top of the body, that someone's just saying, I'm scared of heights, I'm scared of heights. So it's just a short statement to remind this, the person tapping what it is to stay focused. We keep doing the process until that SUDS rating, that discomfort score, is down around a zero. And in all our research, we use standard treatment protocols. So the question does come up, all right, how is it that this tapping thing works? Um, what is it that we know? And certainly next year, we're going to run some research using fMRI studies of the brain with our weight trial. But here's what we know to date, that Stimulating, stimulating these acupressure points or acupoints sends a signal to the limbic system in the body and what's happening in the amygdala, that part of your brain which is the stress response, is the tapping part of the technique is actually calming down the amygdala's arousal. So what happens over time is we seem to get long-term counter conditioning that once something's been calmed down, for example a food craving in my research, 
over time, different neural pathways rewire so a food is no longer part of somebody's uh, repertoire or their daily eating regime and they forget a year later what it is that they did the tapping on because they don't eat that food anymore. So we know that by having the most profound impact on something like the amygdala, the whole body's sensory system is responding. So as someone starts to feel calmer, that obviously helps them regulate stress, any emotional intensity, and then we allow the brain, because we know through neuroplasticity, um, pathways can rewire if they're not being used. And that's what we're finding with our year-long follow-up of our studies, which is very exciting. So here's the basic recipe. One, you need to have a problem. Normally people don't do any of the tapping technique if they're feeling good. Um, it probably would make you feel more good, but most people only do it when there's something negative. So it could be a feeling. Um, so what's the problem, what's the feeling? Rate that out of 10. How bad is it for you at the moment? We do the setup statement while we tap on what we call the karate chop point. So I know you can probably see my camera, but if you were to imagine the karate chop point of where you might karate chop a block of wood, we tap with two fingers on that while we say that sentence out loud. And that sentence again might be something like, even though I have this intense food craving for chocolate Tim Tams at the moment, I accept this about myself anyway. So we say that three times just for clarity and to get into the present moment. We then tap on eight points of the face and top of the body. I'll show you those points in a moment. While we do that, remember we're saying a shortened phrase. So it could be something like this craving, this craving. Take a deep breath when we're finished all eight. Re-rate the intensity out of 10. If it's still fairly high, we just keep doing the tapping process again. If there's a different feeling that's presented itself, we just go to the new feeling instead. And we literally keep repeating that tapping round until it's down to a one or a zero which interestingly for a food craving could take less than five minutes. So here's the pressure points. I'm hoping you can see me, if not walk through with me. So if you take two fingers and you just come to that first point that's there, it's called the eyebrow point. So it's the start of your eyebrow. And if you were to tap there, that's the first point that we start. So as we tap, we're saying the shortened phrase of what it is that's bothering us at the moment. The second one is the side of the eye. The third one is under the eye, on the bone, under the eye. The next one is under the nose. And whilst the next one is the chin point, it's straight under your lips, so it's not too low on your chin. The sixth one is your collarbone. So if you were to come down from your collarbone an inch and tap there. The next one is straight under the arm. And for women, it tends to sit on the top bra strap. And the last one is the dead center of your head. So the dead center. So those po points make up one round. And after that one round, we would say to a client, take a deep breath, let's focus. What was it that was bothering you? Tell me where you're at now with that rating out of 10. And if they weren't down to an order or a one, we would do that again. And it might be we do that three or four times until something like a food craving intensity dropped off. So what have we been looking at? So I came across this technique now about 15 to 18 years ago. I have to calculate that one. Um, and it was only because of my work in eating disorders in my clinical setting that I was looking for techniques that might help with intense anxiety with anorexia. So I had a colleague who had come across EFT, did say to me at that point, look, it's a little bit weird. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't go well. But bit weird, does it work? started to use it with clients and of course um, was able to help reduce anxiety and sufferers of anorexia and people like that in order to you know, allow them to eat more. We address things like body image issues. And then in my role um, as senior lecturer at Griffith University in Medicine now about nine, 10 years ago, we had the opportunity for research. So that's where we started and said, why don't we do some research with the tapping technique why don't we go the other end because of our obesity crisis and have a look at how could we help manage food cravings, emotional eating, portion sizes in overweight and overweight and obese adults. So that first study there, that one that's um, the top point, we actually were able to advertise the study through a TV news network and we had four and a half thousand people come forward for that original study. So to us it really flagged 
a massive gap that was out there in the treatment of overweight and obesity, but particularly not using willpower. So something like tapping, which doesn't use willpower as its main um, technique. So we were overwhelmed with, with the number of people that came forward to that trial. So we'll talk a bit about what happened out of those in a moment. We've since done all these other trials. So clinical depression, um, major depressive episodes we've looked at, cigarette smoking, we've taken it into younger age groups in school settings, so eating behaviours and physical activity and motivation, and also stress exam anxiety, academic fear in students who are in high achieving streams. We've just finished the largest online trial of EFT, which Glenn has been part of as well. So we've taken our original program and we've made it into an online version so that we could actually see is it effective in delivering it in that mode if it's specific enough and the answer at the moment is yes. And we've just finished to a bariatric surgery trial where we looked at the addition of the EFT tapping program with people eating off the portion perfection plates um, and that has worked really well too. So those results will all come out in the next year. So our original trial was a four week program, so two hours tapping a week for four weeks, eight hours, and basically everything we measured, so weight, body, BMI, food cravings, subjective power over food, so willpower, restraint, and psychological coping, coping, the whole lot changed, statistically speaking, and 12 months later stayed statistically changed. So not due to chance, really what we're talking about is this technique had power, lasted over time, and a year later people couldn't remember the food that they tapped on in the four-week program because it had left their, like I said, their, their repertoire or their daily eating plan which was really interesting to us that they just appeared to forget. But what was happening, we suspect, was a new neural pathway started to form. What we then did after that trial was we looked at EFT compared to CBT. So we had we extended it to eight weeks and we had either randomly allocated people to the EFT tapping treatment or cognitive behavioural therapy. Same deal, overweight, obese adults and just for food cravings, emotional eating. So EFT was as effective as CBT um, to increase power over food, willpower and restraint and it was actually superior a year later to CBT to decrease food cravings and anxiety and of course the interplay between anxiety and food cravings is huge so that didn't surprise us but over that year the CBT participants actually had their food cravings re-emerge and their anxiety. So we knew that we are definitely on to something here and just to have evidence for other techniques that maybe our traditional therapies don't capture um, is important. So that paper Excuse has me, actually yeah. just... Yes, Glenn, go. We've just got a, a good question here when you're talking about the sustained results of the tapping. Do yes. the people, do you know if the people still use the tapping technique 12 months later? Yes, look, it's a great question and we ask that. So at six months and 12 months we ask and the answer overwhelmingly is no. <laughs> so <laughs> human beings are human beings and, and same with our student trials. They don't use it outside of our, you'll get the odd outlier who goes, oh, this is fantastic, I'm going to use it for everything in my life. But overwhelmingly no. So it's the impact of the treatment only. So the EFT-CBT trial was eight weeks, two hours a week, so 16 hours of tapping. We increased it. And funnily enough, that's enough. So they don't use it from that point forward. So it is a great question and, and one that we do get asked a lot. doesn't appear to be needed for whatever you've already tapped on. You don't have to keep repeating the exact same thing. You just might use it for something different. Is that good? Beautiful. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and that one trial we have run, um, I had some students investigating for their uh, master's thesis in psychology, clinical depression and EFT, and we compared that to CBT as well. Um, it, it was only a small pilot. It was a fairly difficult trial to run. Um, it was eight weeks again, but it did, it was as effective as CBT um, in reducing the symptoms and maintain that six months later. The EFT people weren't meeting diagnosis six months later for major depressive disorder. Um, even though we only had 14 in that trial, it did appear to work. The school trials have been really good. We had schools approach us, so we had no idea we would end up in schools, um, but we had two main schools, 204 students there, all in year 10, and they were all in advanced academic streams in year 10. 
So they had um, fear of failure issues and difficulties, self-esteem, resilience issues. So we went in there for five weeks and taught them the tapping for 75 minutes each week for five weeks in a row, follow them up a year later. And again, statistically speaking, their fear of failure and difficulties were significantly lower a year later. Um, and they loved it. We, um, we had a good time in there. Year nine, we've had one school go through students wanting to improve their eating habits. There were eating and self-esteem about three months later and they finished the school year at that point. Um, so we couldn't follow them up any further. But again, it appeared to um, impact. We had um, parents of children in that, students in that trial, emailing the principal saying their children were suddenly asking if they could buy broccoli and cauliflower <laughs> in the shopping that week. So we knew something was happening. It was spontaneous, um, which has been amazing. And then our online trial, um, we've had over 500 people worldwide do the eight-week food craving program, um, and it was it's all video delivery. So uh, those videos of, of myself um, and some of Glenn as well, where we're instructing tapping through all different topics that we know are relevant to the weight area. Um, and today, Peter, sorry, yeah, Peter, we just had another question just regarding all of these studies. If if the, the which of these studies have been published, and yeah. and I know that you can, I think you can find some of them uh, on one of your links on your your website or the Bond website. Yes, all of them have been published. So the online trial won't come out for another year. All the other studies are published. At the end, there'll be a slide with my researcher page at Vaughan University. So if a paper is freely available, it'll be on there. If it's not, email me and I'm happy to send them. I'm allowed to send them out individually like that. We just can't always post them online if they have copyright issues. But everything has been published, um, yeah. bar that online trial and the bariatric one. They'll come out. All right, I'll tell you about the online program. Um, and Glenn knows a lot about this as well. We had fun a video lot. on it all. <laughs> a lot. So we, we had seven modules. It was self-paced over eight weeks. And in addition to that, we had a private or a secret Facebook group that people could opt in, but roughly about 80% of people in the trial were opting in to be a member of that group. So people like Glenn and myself um, and other people that were part of the admin of the trial could answer questions worldwide. So people might post from you know Norway the night before and Canada and the UK and we would answer. And they were all learning from each other through those answers. Um, so each module had several lessons in it, so anywhere from three to five, three to eight lessons, and they were all videos. Um, so you can see that they ended up with six hours worth of videos, little mini quizzes to move to the next module, so we could see they weren't skipping ahead. Um, all video, weekly handouts, the Facebook support, um, weekly emails from us as a team, and they get access forever. So when the trial ended, um, we certainly didn't limit their access, they can actually access that and go back and revisit videos if they want to. Um, and it's been a huge success. So you can see every variable we've been measuring, same kind of things, food craving, restraint, willpower, depression, anxiety, somatic symptoms. All of the changes in the program have changed, statistically speaking. So food cravings have significantly dropped off. Willpower has significantly increased, that kind of thing. Six month follow-ups occurring at the moment. And I guess our aim in this has been very much around what about people out there that are rural and remote who can't attend treatment for whatever reason? How can we make sure that they get evidence-based treatment programs? And video delivery has been really, um, really useful in that. So it has actually worked really well. Funnily enough, it's, <laughs> I don't think I've told Glenn this, it's the most I've ever felt to being famous. <laughs> because I don't consider myself famous at all. Because people watch all these videos of me looking down the camera, um, they felt like they knew me. And I was at a conference recently in America where some people that had been part of that trial attended the conference and came up and spoke to me like they knew me and I had no idea who they were. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess watching a certain number of videos of somebody does make you feel like you're um, <laughs> their best friend. You just got to remind them they don't know who you are. <laughs> So that's quite bizarre. Anyway, it's all good. You can see these are just, I just thought I'd show you some of the comments that were coming out of the Facebook group for this online trial because we knew reading these 
the video delivery was working. So you can see this person said, I had a mini breakthrough. I was tapping on oatmeal raisin cookies. Um, that was her catnip. I discovered my attachment to these round gut bombs from a family memory. I look forward to making these cookies with my mum. It was a whole day when I had her to myself and it made Christmas so special. So now I can occasionally enjoy one cookie and fill myself with happiness through other means. So she worked that out, tapping just with the video herself. Um, someone else wrote, does anyone feel happier since we started this trial? I've started to experience periods of downright jubilation. It's kind of weird and very wonderful. Um, and another one down the bottom there about salt and vinegar chips. She redid the tapping twice, that video, um, because they do have the food in front of them as exposure therapy and realised it wasn't about the food, it was about procrastinating and boredom. Um, so once she got those realisations, the craving dropped off um, and she didn't want them, she threw them in the bin, yay me. So it was just amazing to see. And I do definitely think that Facebook secret group added a human element to that online trial that I would always include in future. I just think it gave it something that doing it online by yourself may not necessarily if you're not internally motivated. All right. So now we've sort of outlined a little bit about what's the trial. Um, what I wanted to share with you now was all the things we've learnt that we know are really important for um, weight issues. So after nine years of running these kind of trials with tapping, there's definitely things that I think mainstream programs aren't covering. These type of questions, um, and I won't read through all of them, but we found that by asking these types of questions either before someone starts therapy or during with you, really gave a lot of information about where were these cravings coming from. If they're really just a surface uh, thing that's going on for someone and really you're trying to find the root cause. Questions like number five, what's your first memory of eating the food you love? You know, often that question on its own suddenly gave someone access to memories that they didn't realise were there and they were trying to replicate a feeling that came from way back but in their current food craving. You know, what's your best memory that involves food? Were you given food as a child to comfort you? So great questions just to sort of have up your sleeve. We know that food cravings, and this includes emotional eating, portion size, overeating, that kind of thing as well. There's so many pieces of the puzzle. I mean, everything from, you know, what's your feeling, what's your beliefs, but your body awareness, past feelings, you know, future goals, that kind of thing. And all of those pieces of the puzzle really do make up that bigger picture of weight and certainly weight loss and weight maintenance. And I think we have to look at all of them. So EFT as a tool um, can obviously immediately reduce a food craving. Like I said, five minutes. You know, I've done that with many a journalist. Said, here, give me a muffin. Let's get rid of your craving. <laughs> Eliminate body image issues, neutralizing issues from the past that might still have a powerful um, reach target future situations, so certainly if someone was worried about attending something like a wedding and if they were going to overeat, you can use tapping for those sorts of feelings and any kind of irrational beliefs people might have about food or weight and, it, and certainly hereditary factors if they think I'm never going to get over this, everyone in my family is like this. That could just be a belief um, and tapping works on that. These are the common things that we were looking at in all of our programs. And Stress, so food as a soother, uh, loneliness. The flip, so exercise and motivation issues as in not enjoying exercise um, and not having much motivation, so tapping can increase things. Food as comfort as a child, so family sort of love language patterns. Drinking water, so definitely um, addressing that kind of thing. Cho using food to change mood reaching somebody's ideal body shape, like any negatives attached to that. Certainly we had many, many a client who in the past might have reached their ideal body shape but were, it was sabotaged by other people in their life or perhaps wasn't accepted by other people in their life so it was easier to go back to the way that they were. Other negative consequences that might be there and maybe just that lack of belief in even achieving it if somebody had never got to their ideal weight. I just thought I'd share you because I've had a, a really good question here. When you you're talking through all of those, the, the, you know those those benefits that the tapping can have, but having a benefit in such a short space of time. Um, yes. Someone's asked is that you know is there anything to suggest that the benefit is just in distracting the person 
when yeah. they're for that moment that they're thinking about that that technique and they're you know they're not particularly mindful of the, the problem you're just sort of distracting yourself with the tapping yeah it's a really good question I guess the the answer mostly is it Tapping doesn't work if you're distracted. So if you're tapping and you're in the mindful, you're in the present moment and you're tapping, you've got your food in front of you because all of our food craving research is, is exposure therapy. So you might have the chocolate bar in front of you. If you're actually identifying it's there in front of you then and there. Um, the tapping on it is actually engaging the amygdala if you're being honest about what's happening for you now. You know, you're salivating, the smell's driving you crazy, you just want to eat it. So as you tap through that and the amygdala calms down, then we know that our longer term follow up and research is suggesting that the distraction in that moment can't be distraction because it's staying reduced. So even week by week in our treatment programs, if we were to say to somebody, oh, how's your you know, finger bun with icing and butter, they look at you blankly and go, oh, I haven't had one of those all week. And it's like, well, you were eating five a day. What do you mean? So we know yeah. that if it was a distraction, more willpower would have to be required in those follow-on periods, and it appears not to be. So, yeah. so one, it doesn't work if you're distracted. You actually have to be in the present moment, which is different to a lot of therapy techniques that might just be trying to get you to change how you think about something mm -hmm. rather than address it head-on for what it is. So, yeah. But it is a really good question. It does come up um, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I'll just flick through. This is the second part of why we address a certain thing in our weight programs and it came from not only our trials but we analysed 89 food diaries in our original four week program. So we had two weeks prior and then four weeks of the treatment. We had six weeks of these food diaries. The reason why we only looked at females was men were really bad at completing their food diaries. <laughs> so we didn't have any men. And we've published this so again this is available. Um, so we looked at them all and kind of went what are the themes? What are they coding all of their eating of any food in the day to? And ultimately, we came up with all of these different um, themes, you know, physiological enjoyment, missing out reward, wastage, emotional, or the external environment. It was just there. And when I say, what do you think the most common theme was? The results indicated number one, and these are in hierarchy, was wastage. The reason why these people were eating was so not to waste the food. The second reason was an emotion, a strong emotion, and the third reason was I want to reward myself. So I've been to the gym, been a good girl, now I'll have my muffin, that kind of thing. So wastage number one really stood out and we were like, what is this? So ultimately what we came down to, um, and we looked at some epigenetic considerations there because of the age of women in our groups, but when a craving is reduced through the tapping technique and we say to a client, a participant sitting there, okay, you don't want to eat it. You're telling me it's, you've got no desire anymore for this particular food. Can you throw it out? So here's the bit. You've probably only had one little bite as we were tapping. Can you throw the food out? And what happens for about 50% of people is they have this enormous eruption of negative feelings around wastage if they attempt to walk to the bin and throw this food out. And it comes down to some of those beliefs that are taught when we're little, and I think it's still taught. I don't think we've moved past the world wars and Great Depressions too well, because this message just keeps getting passed down, passed down, passed down. So this was an example of a statement, even though I was taught I must not waste food or leave anything on my plate, and I feel guilty and anxious if I do, I deeply and completely accept myself anyway. So we did a lot of work on this second layer for people in our groups in all of our trials, including the online trial, because a lot of people don't realise this is here. This layer, this second layer is here with weight issues, that sometimes it might be that it is more of a healthy choice, but instead of going, no, I've had enough, I don't need it, they eat it so not to throw it out and have a bad feeling like guilt or anxiety. So it is some something that if you're just doing your own work out there with weight clients, try and have a look at that in different clients of your own and see whether or not that's landing because I think until it comes to the surface, people don't realise it's there. And Peter, the there's, a really good, yeah. oh, sorry, there's, a, there's a really good question come through that just reminded me when you were speaking about um, a lot of people will be looking to use this technique with clients. Someone's asked, uh, you know, how often does the person need to tap to get the effect? 
Um, yeah. And sort of second to that, is it is it just kind of whenever the person has a craving, or uh, are you aiming to induce that craving so you can then work on it as you've done in the, the trials? Yes, yeah, so we, we do always suggest, um, if you're doing it with a client in a session, induce the craving, get them to bring the food in. So have it there. The moment it is in front of them, as long as it's not something that's specific to only a certain time of day, and alcohol is one of those, um, so this does work well with alcohol, but we, we didn't include that in our in-person trials because it was exposure therapy and we didn't want them driving home, but we did in the online program, So, but we said to them, only do it at the time of day that that craving would come up, which might be late afternoon, hopefully, um, not nine o'clock in the morning. But if you're in a session with somebody and they bring their food in and they open it up and they start to engage, the craving will be there. So most of the time, if you tap through that craving with the client and it drops off and they're like, no, I don't want it, throw it in the bin, whatever, they won't have to tap on that craving ever again because it's done. So I know that seems different to a lot of what we're, and I certainly teach in a master's program that's very mainstream, you know, psychology techniques and none of them are like this. So if a craving was to resurface for that food you tapped on, all we suggest is there's probably a slightly different aspect to it that you didn't cover in whatever tapping you did in person. It doesn't mean the tapping didn't work. It's just sometimes there might be more than one piece of the puzzle to a food for somebody. But the most I've ever had somebody had to tap on a food is two or three times and that's it. It's done for life. So sometimes you get a generalization effect where you tap on one biscuit. So I've had clients tap on one biscuit and it generalizes to all biscuits. But for other clients, it's like, no, they have to tap on the chocolate Tim Tam, the chocolate Monte Carlo, the chocolate, I don't know, whatever else there is. So, because they're all slightly different for that person in the craving, whatever it is, smell, taste, whatever, mint chocolate or something like that. So if you get a generalization effect, it's it's a bonus. It's like fantastic. It happened to me. So I, um, I've tapped on the odd food every now and again, um, not due to weight, but just not to have to worry about eating it. And I tapped on one gay time ice cream. So does everyone remember a gay time? You know, what they look like? Um, and when I'll just tap on one gay time. I just don't want to feel like eating them ever again. And it generalized to all ice cream. So that was probably 10 years ago. <laughs> so I don't eat any ice cream because I tapped on one gay time. So the question and comes up. What do you say? I know there'll be people asking this question. It's one that, that we get all the time when people say, and I know you have an answer to this, but when people say, I don't want to not want my gay time, or I yeah, don't want to I not knew want that was going to happen. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so we don't force a, anyone to tap on anything. So if you want to be engaged in a program, obviously it's offered, but people choose. Um, I can tell you, I've never tapped on cheesecake, and I probably won't <laughs> because I want to have something when I go out, maybe, you know, nice gluten free base or something on my cheesecake. Um, so you don't have to tap on everything. The other thing is, and I think this is the answer, is the only reason you think you're going to miss it is you're on this side of the fence at the moment. And when you tap and there's no intensity, what we say is, can you miss something you no longer feel like having? And I think that's that's ultimately what ends up happening, is you only miss it at the moment because of the idea of giving it up. But if you tap and you have zero desire, you don't actually miss it. It's gone. And literally that could take five or ten minutes. So. We'll have to run another webinar where everyone brings their food and we'll just tap on foods. <laughs> okay, where to from here? Because people are probably like, oh, what do I do now? Because um, this has been a whirlwind um, <laughs> webinar, just to throw it all out there. There is a worldwide site, so EFT Universe. Um, you can have a look on that website. They have a regular newsletter, mini manuals free, that kind of thing. What is unique about that website, though, is there are many, many, there's thousands of practitioners worldwide, many psychiatrists, GPs, nurses, a lot of health professionals trained in EFT around the world, and they upload a lot of their cases to that website with the exact words that they used. So you can go onto that, and if you're like, I've got a client with fibromyalgia, I wonder if someone else has done fibromyalgia. And they, you type it in to the website and you'll get all these cases that come up from a lot of health professionals that will say, yep, here's my client, here's what I addressed, here's what I found out. You can Google chronic pain, you could Google irritable bowel syndrome, you could Google anything you like on EFT Universe and you'll find cases. Um, I must say I'm a bit slack in uploading my own, but there's plenty up there. 
you can do an EFT training course. Um, that's probably the next step for a lot of people that go, okay, I want to experience this and I do want to end up being able to do it competently with clients. Um, there's three trainers for EFT Universe in Australia, so I'm one of them. Um, come to the lovely Gold Coast in October if you want to. There's a couple of other really great websites there to have a look at. Our online treatment program is available online now. Um, it's no longer free, of course, because the clinical trial is over, but if people do want to access that, certainly um, if you've got the slides, you can just click on it and have a look. So that is there. There's a couple of really great clinical EFT handbooks that have been published in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, so there's volume one and volume two. They're, they're not for lay people, so they're not for clients to read, they are for practitioners. Um, and every chapter in the book is a different topic that is relevant. There's a lot in there on trauma, how to use it for PTSD. Um, you can see there's other bits and pieces like addiction, family therapy. The weight loss chapter I wrote, so mine's in volume two. Um, and they're amazing books to actually, I have got them sitting here on my bookshelf, amazing books to have because you can actually open them up, you can read a bit about neuroplasticity in one chapter, epigenetics in another, how to use it for sports performance in another one, how to use it for chronic pain and every chapter's got like scripts, so words that you can use with clients to get started. Uh, so you can buy those online, have a look, but they are a really handy resource to, I still open them every now and again and have a, have a look. Um, very easy to connect, that's me, obviously you can see me anyway. Email, that's my research page where all our publications are to date. If you only get a link to an abstract, just email me and I'll send you the complete paper because not all of them are allowed to be uploaded. The social media links um, are work related, so we share all of our research, everything, the free clinical trials that are happening, um, so you can have a look through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, link to all of those if you want to. Um, I promise you I won't kind of put up photos of my children, stuff like that, <laughs> or what I'm eating for dinner. <laughs> It'll be very professional work related. <laughs> You're laughing, Glenn. There's a bunch of our publications, so that's just um, some of them. There's probably one or two that aren't, aren't there, but you can see right through from when we started um, coming right through all the different bits and pieces. We've just finished a chronic pain trial. So up here in Queensland, the Persistent Pain Program as part of Queensland Health has now included EFT in its 12-month tra treatment program. So we did a follow-up, a six-month follow-up on the first group that went through that. Um, and lo and behold, well, it's not surprising to us anymore, but it works really well on chronic pain. So they've just renewed that for another couple of years to have EFT continuing to be included in that chronic pain program, persistent pain. Look, it's been a whirlwind, Glenn, but I think I've nearly nailed the 40 minutes. So we are at a point where we can answer more questions. I think, Peter, you are pretty bang on that, that 40 minutes. And we do have, um, we do have some other questions. Um, someone asked, um, they, they said they have done a little short EFT course before but was yep. wondering which of those courses are actually accredited courses. Yeah, let me go back. Um, and not all of them are. So if you do a training through EFT Universe, um, they're what we call certified courses. So it's two levels, two days per level, so four days in a row, and that'll end up giving you the level two certification. Um, there is some paperwork that follows that four day in-person training. You can take as long as you like to do that, so you'll go off and do some case studies, have your trainer review those, that kind of thing. Um, we certainly talk about different bits like Aon now offer specific insurance for EFT, um, so we kind of let you know all those bits and pieces as well so that that particular technique is covered. So I would say there's, there's a lot available online these days, but really you want to attend in person. You want to actually, you will do the techniques on yourself. We unpack how to use EFT for trauma and PTSD um, and how to run it as a movie technique and things like that in level one. So it is well worth attending in person rather than trying to maybe navigate online. And we do food cravings in the training. So everyone brings a food and we literally show you how to do that. So. There's some good stuff and there. Absolutely. And everyone out there, I couldn't speak more highly of, of Peter's training course. I've had um, encouraged colleagues to do it. Uh, I've had a bunch of clients do workshops with her and her team. And it's really nice. I suppose as a psychologist, we always want somebody who is a trained psychologist as well. That means more to us. And also 
for, for something that is for a lot of us a very different type of a technique, it's it's important to us to, to, to have someone like you, Peter, who is has a foot in the, the, the practice and, a, and the teaching and a real firm foot in the research. So so I think Peter's course is really great, guys. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess, um, yeah, and I do think, you know, being a psychologist, you do bring something to that. And even though, like, on the surface it looks like, man, this technique looks really simple, it has such a complexity to it and a depth of where you can use it and what you can use it for that you don't learn a lot of that unless you come in person. So um, we always have a great time. <laughs> Absolutely. Do. I know I've you know done so much through our online course of you, Peter, and then all of you know the the, the, the workshops that I've attended of yours, and I've just written down you know half a page of my own notes of things that I learn something every time I listen to you. Um, there's a really good question here, and I think this is a really good time for the question too, because um, it's a question that a lot of people have. And, and there's some new newer research out that that, that, that I'm aware of that's, that tested this. What the person was asking, and I'll just make sure I got the words right. Is there any research into looking at whether the, the tapping process actually adds anything more than just mindfulness or exposure, or yeah. if there is anything in those acupressure points or, or versus placebo? Yes, yeah. There have been, and I, I believe that I could send these out if anyone wants them. Um, it wasn't us, but there have been three what they call dismantling studies that have actually been run um, in America. So where people unattached to the technique dismantled the technique to sort of say, all right, let's have a group that do sham tapping points. Uh, so points just tap anywhere on your body. Um, let's have a group that does deep breathing only. Let's have a group that just does the cognition but no tapping, you know you know what I'm talking about. Um, and all of those studies are showing that it's the combination combined. So it appears that when you dismantle them out, if you're just saying a statement, really that's probably more cognitive behavioural therapy and you're exposing and staying maybe in the present moment. But distress takes a lot longer perhaps to come down for certain clients. Um, so it does appear as though it's the combination of the pressure points that are used. And there's pressure points all over your body. There's no magic in, you know, necessarily. It's just there's eight that are used in this so that A, there's a formula to follow and B, the research has shown that those eight clinical points are enough to tap on. For children, we only use four points. So a whole nother kind of presentation on how do you use this for kids. Because little children as young as four can use tapping. And we use bears and things like that. They only use four points. So so the dismantling studies have been done. Happy to share those. Um, we have, we're, we're about to have a DNA study. Um, Dawson Church, who runs EFT Universe, has done a study on the genes that are turned off and on by the tapping, the eight clinical tapping points. And I've just read his paper. It has been accepted. So it will come out in the next month or so. And like I flagged, at Bond, we're running an fMRI study next year with the Food Craving Program. So we want to know what is happening in the brain and what are the parts. Is it similar to mindfulness and meditation where the amygdala quietens down with the tapping technique? And I guess what I like, because I'm, I'm a meditator and I love mindfulness, we run a whole centre at Bond on mindfulness, but I think what I like about the tapping in addition to that is because it's a practical thing, if you strike a client that just can't do mindfulness or can't meditate, they can actually tap and if they want to they can tap with both hands and it still brings them into the present moment and they feel like they're doing something about their problem and at the same time we're getting an effect on the brain. So I just think to have another technique that's got enough evidence and efficacy behind it just allows us to reach more clients out there. Yeah, I know having a background in the, the cognitive behaviour therapy and specialising in weight management, even though the, the type of food awareness journals we do are very different to a food diary. We do a food diary. Don't make me write this down. And it seems that the tapping technique is, is is something that a lot of people seem to be happier to do than say write down a, a food diary or do a thought reframing exercise. So it just gives you that sort of breadth. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And Peter, now I, I I have these studies. I haven't read them, but I was aware of some studies also that were testing the acupressure points that are tapped on in EFT versus sham points. Yep, yep, yep. That's going, some of those three studies. So yeah. the points don't appear to have any effect. Actually, I have funny. got. Can you see my 
you can see me, the video, because I'm looking at yep. the slides. So you can see what I've got is an AccuPen. So you can actually buy things like this and they light up to 100% when you hit an acupressure point. So you just run them over your face or any part of your body and they beep when you hit an acupressure point. But there's gaps in your body between acupressure points. So wow. they're amazing. We have these in our training courses now and people play with them and things like that. Um, I'm ma married to an engineer who's, you know, incredibly black and white, but he loves this because he's like, man, you don't have pressure points all over yourself. So that's the sham point thing, that if you tap somewhere here and there's no pressure point, you don't get as much of a, an effect unless it was radiating out. So we know, like, your pressure point here will light up and beep, but as you drag it, it stops. There's no pressure point along your hairline until you reach another one. So, yeah, I think that's yeah. something that's, that's fairly interesting to me to notice, you know, as a, as a practitioner and a fairly practical sort of a, a, a practitioner, I don't really mind whether it's the acupressure points or the, it, whether it's just tapping on your body, but it appears that it is something in the actual acupressure points. Yeah, from what we know. So, um, and like I said, there, there are some published papers on that and I guess, you know, people out there that run those studies have an interest in seeing, so not necessarily EFT aligned, but have an interest in seeing, but they're all coming up with the same results that, well, it appears as though you actually have to hit the pressure point for something to happen. Yeah. So speaking of that question, there was a, someone else had a great question about tapping discreetly and how to, obviously this is not a technique you might want to do, you know, in front of your work colleagues, otherwise it could lead to some, some problems. What, how would you... <laughs> advise people who say, I don't really have anywhere that I could tap or how do I use this technique? Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, and what we do teach in some of the school programs that we run, because we do run um, a whole bunch of those now, is for some students you can actually touch the pressure point and just hold it. So as long as in your mind you're staying focused on the problem, you're not drifting off to something else. So if you were to touch and hold, and then just sort of, that's a little bit more discreet, so you could do that in public transport, you can just touch and hold, no one really knows what you're doing, that kind of thing. So you can touch and hold, but the other one we teach our students is our original EFT method 30 years ago included the finger points, because there's a pressure point on the side of each nail bed, and hence why people bite their nails for anxiety reduction. So any nail biters out there might go, oh yeah, it feels good. Because you've actually, if I run my AccuPen there, there's a pressure point on each side of your nail bed. So what you can do is squeeze both sides. So you can actually squeeze and hold, do the same statement in your mind, but squeeze and hold, and you can do that under a table or in your lap. So we do teach that to students to do in an exam situation where they can't actually openly tap or they don't want anyone to know. So you can use all of your finger points. We no longer use those in any clinical research. Any of the fingers, Peter. Sorry? Any of the fingers. Any of the fingers, they all have a pressure point. And even if you were to just bite the sides of your nails, you actually f can feel a reduction in, it's why people bite their nails. Um, you can actually feel like, oh, it feels, because there's a pressure point on each side. Yeah, <laughs> it's very cool. <laughs> so you can do that, it, it's handy, yeah. Yeah, very, oh, very cool, very handy. A few clients will be getting that this week. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, a really good question about especially, and I think some people are a bit freaked out by the negative statements when you're saying those yeah. negative statements while you're tapping. Um, yeah. Are there any risks or any times when you wouldn't do tapping? Um, let me think. If you didn't feel very skilled and confident, <laughs> that would be my answer. If you didn't feel very skilled, because you are absolutely right, Glenn, the moment you engage someone in something like a trauma memory, if you don't feel confident in being able to move that client through with, there's a certain tapping technique we use for that, then you are going to leave that client in that state. But having said that, if you're skilled in it, you're also maybe a psychologist, you've worked with trauma before, what happens with tapping is because it will calm your amygdala, the, the moment distress comes up for someone, if you keep tapping, the person will calm down and they will stop crying. So it's the most amazing tool to stop. You're connecting straight to the amygdala. So the only risk is... I mean, because we use it for severe PTSD, severe chronic pain, trauma, we use it for anything, as long as you know not to abort the process when someone gets really distressed. And if someone was to close their eyes, they must, you, I mean, we get a bit bossy and sort of say, open your eyes, you must look at me. And even if you're tapping as the therapist 
and they're watching you or if they will allow you to tap on them, you must keep the process going in order to collapse it, to collapse the distress. So the only thing I would say is, because we've got so much research now around different pockets of what it works for, is it, it would only be your own confidence level. Yeah. Because, like you know, Glenn, you might think you're easily tapping on something light and fairy like a chocolate bar and all of a sudden that person loses the plot and starts to become hysterical because the tapping's instantly taken them back to where the root cause of this chocolate bar was, which actually might have been a trauma. And you don't know that and they don't remember it before they start. Yeah. I remember so, doing my first yeah. detailed tapping workshop with you and um, when it came tapping time around the food, we were all walking around with tissues. I'm like, why are we having these tissues for? And you know, said, yeah. well, we will see. Wait. <laughs> yeah. well, there's a lot of food, um, and particularly in obesity, there's some trauma that sits in that for people. So they don't anticipate it, but in the hands of skilled therapists, they will actually be able to collapse that. So it's why we say do the do the proper training so they actually learn the different types of ways you can apply. There's a whole bunch of it's why EFT stands for EF, emotional freedom techniques. So whilst it's only one tapping technique. There's all these different ways you can apply it, um, and certainly we teach people how to do that. So, yeah. And just coming back to your training, Peter, someone has just asked the the EFT universe uh, yeah. training. That's different to your training, isn't it? No, no, I'm an EFT no. universe trainer. No, you were an EFT universe trainer. Yeah, yeah. I'm an EFT okay, universe. Trainer. Yeah, yeah. so that's exactly. Well, Peter, thank you so much. I think that's um, that's tons of questions, um, and I think you've answered them brilliantly. Actually, you know what? I've got one really, really quick one. Yes. Just you know, be, me being a psychologist who specialises in weight management, it's it's interesting that some of the most common things we do for for weight management, like the diet and exercise program, are notoriously ineffective, and in fact, can be counterproductive. But yeah. what is seemingly a, a strange technique to a lot of people can actually work at least as good as our psychology's gold standard in some areas, possibly better. How, yeah. how do you introduce the tapping technique to people and what, what hope do you see for this in really becoming a, a more dominant therapy in the, the weight management area? Yeah, um, great question, and and I I'm I'm so supported. I think in my research, I'm blessed at Bond. Um, yeah, I'm well supported and even the media in Australia are supporting this as well. I guess because people are looking for something else and it has always just been our intention not to prove it's better than anything else but just to give another valid evidence-based you know, kind of option for people that may have tried all the traditional things and it just hasn't worked for them but here's another one that we know we've got enough evidence for. So I guess um, yeah, part of it is that, that if we could see it become a more mainstream technique, that it's used for anxiety and reduction, um, you know, in the UK, the mindfulness in the UK schools program is using mindfulness as a daily technique. We would love to see tapping be used in schools as a daily stress management technique for all the students out there. That just becomes a normal way of, you know, like my two girls are 9 and 13 and and they just they tap. It's just normal for them. They're like, yeah, got a bad feeling, don't want it anymore. I'm going to tap and it's gone away. So part of it is that it becomes more mainstream and maybe it gets introduced to some of our bigger weight management programs out there worldwide um, to help people with things like willpower and stuff like that. How do I introduce it to tech? So if I had a client individually, one-on-one, -on -one, um, normally they've tried a lot of other things. So I'll sort of say, what have you tried? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Um, and I'll say, look, if they haven't already found me online and read some of our research, I might say, look, there is this technique. It works on pressure points in the body. Um, we do tap on those instead of putting a needle in. Um, you know, it seems a little bit strange. It might look a little bit weird, but we do seem to think that this works. We've got a lot of research. Do you want to give it a go? <laughs> and Fantastic. nobody yeah. ever says no. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> okay, cool. It's not that they can't review. <laughs> so, you know, we've got to just make it nice and relaxed and kind of go, yeah, I'll do it with you. Um, and that's the other thing that I might just flag is when you tap with a client on a food issue, yours might get affected. <laughs> so The nice sort of borrowed benefits. Yeah. It's a huge borrowing benefits, but you may not eat chocolate again yourself. <laughs> If it's similar. I had a few of those after doing our tapping trial. Goodbye, Diet Coke. You're watching me, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. 
All right, well, Peter, thank you so much for, for talking to us all today. I think that, you know, there is so much promise in this and I know that, that 10 years ago people were telling me about this technique and I was giving them a polite response of, you know, there's no real evidence that I can, can see that it works in our area and thinking in my head, well, that's a bit of a strange technique. But it's due to, to you and all of your colleagues doing the, the research that are, that are helping us understand that this can actually be, um, be a very efficacious tool for people. And, um, and I'm sure there will be a, a fair few people watching today that will be starting to dip their toes into the, the tapping water. Right. The more the merrier because I can't clone myself. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, look, I'm just happy to share the message and where we're at and where we're going. So if anyone wants to connect and ask any other questions, please feel free. Great. Beautiful. Thanks Thank so you, Peter. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Yeah. Bye.